Hello and welcome to the Terminal 4 webinar on how to run an effective web content management system evaluation and procurement process. My name is Piero Tintori and I'm CEO here at Terminal 4. Based on about 15 years experience uh, working on probably about 200 to 300 requests for proposal documents a year. Um, we see the good, the bad and the ugly and really what today we want to do is share a lot of tips and insider knowledge on how to run the best process in order to select the right web content management system or digital engagement system for your organization. Just as a quick introduction to Terminal 4, we're a digital engagement platform and web content management system, uh, mainly designed for universities and colleges. But everything we're going to talk about today can definitely be applied across industries and even be used to select other software products, even uh, marketing technology products. Um, all of it today is really from about two decades of experience working in this industry. May, really responding to hundreds of RFPs and helping our clients select other third-party solutions that will integrate with our own. Um, and from that, we work very, very closely with very large universities and colleges, about 150 all around the world, that have given us a really wide view of different universities and colleges' requirements in this area. But as I said, everything I'm going to cover today in the webinar can definitely be applied to other industries and even other uh, solutions. So what are we going to cover in today's webinar? Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is really why is it so important to select the right system and manage the process correctly. Some of this might sound a little bit obvious, but actually I think there's some interesting views on this that I'd like to share with you. And um, the second part really is, is how to run an effective evaluation and procurement slash purchasing process. Really that's covering two points. One is actually how to evaluate vendors and the solutions uh, successfully, uh, because it's not just time based, you know, the more time you stare at a solution isn't going to mean that you're evaluating it uh, in a very detailed way. And the second part is really the purchasing and procurement process. And this will vary from organization to organization. Uh, some organizations take a very sort of agile view to that, maybe more hands-on a view to evaluating systems. Others have to go through a lot more paperwork. So we'll try and cover off uh, and provide some advice there to help things run uh, more successfully. The third thing we're gonna look at is I suppose the role of the RFT or the RFP as part of an evaluation process. And I suppose that's really quite key. Um, so an RFT is really a, what's called a request for tender document. An RFP is request for proposals. Really what they mean is here's a document of our requirements. We want vendors to reply and we're going to use that as a basis for evaluation. Sometimes people focus a little bit too much on it, but they are important documents, particularly if you're a publicly funded organization. The the letters RFP, are, uh, RFP is used more internationally. Um, US, commercial companies around the world. Uh, RFT tends to be used in more uh, publicly funded organizations or government agencies in say Canada, the United Kingdom um, and so on. Y you may also see the phrase RFI and RFI is what's called a request for information document. Typically that's a more informal process where they s people, um, a co an organization like yourselves may send out a request to many different vendors and you just want to get background information on the products. Typically you'll then look through that background information and if you need to either pro, uh, proceed into say an RFP process or you may just use that as the basis for your evaluation. A lot of this will depend on your sort of your your purchasing rules within your organization. The fourth thing we're going to look at is really how getting inside the mind of your vendor so you can negotiate a successful um, project plan and purchasing plan with them. And I'll explain that a little bit more later on, but there's some good tips there just to understand where vendors like ourselves are coming from. Um, but it, it's really all about, it's all about trying to find a partner that you can work with in the long term. The fifth thing we're going to look at is how to evaluate uh, vendors uh, efficiently. 
And it's not, as I said earlier on, it's not just about, you know, working for months and months and doing pilot projects and things like that. And they they do actually um, contribute a lot to to the process of selecting the right product. But it's also looking at like, can you work with them? And I think that's uh, that's important. We'll talk about that as well. The um, the sixth thing, and really the final thing we're going to, to really sum up the webinar today, is looking at really the 10 golden rules. Um, I've sort of tried to build up a small list of, uh, of 10 items that you can really, really take away with you and take on board almost straight away that will have an immediate impact on selecting the right uh, products for your organization. Um, but as part of that also, what are we not going to cover today? And I suppose the first thing is we're not going to cover uh, digital engagement platforms or web content managers and the benefits of those systems. Obviously, you know, they can have an amazing impact on your organization and Terminal 4 are obviously the best in the market, but we're not going to cover the pros and cons um, of different systems or what they bring to the table. We're not going to talk about how you pr uh, structure your project team, the types of resources, the skills that are needed and where they're based, although very, very important. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. We're also not going to talk about budgets, like how much should you budget for, because it really varies. The one thing I would say is that it really depends on, um, it really depends on fit. What I would say is, let's just take two extremes. Let's say, uh, say, a free open source solution versus a high-end commercial product. What you may see is, well, the, the you know the the open source product is free. I think what you really need to look at is what's known as the total cost of ownership. Okay, the product may be free, but what resources do you need? What skills do you need? What is the cost? Who's going to be responsible if something goes wrong? For if you need commercial support for those free solutions is that how much is that going to cost you uh, also if you're doing upgrades what are the is the upgrade cost and compare that to say the top end commercial products and um you know where you might find that the product is more out of the box uh, so you're able to do things quicker so really what i would say there is look at the total cost of ownership and don't rule people out but be upfront with the vendor so that they uh, they can almost rule themselves out if they don't feel that uh, um they're the right fit for you. And really the last thing we're not going to cover is we're not going to go into specific solutions as to why a certain solution is the best and so on. Obviously Terminal 4 is a great platform and we'd be happy to, to show it to you and, and show you some great case studies of where we had a real impact in organizations. But definitely that's not something that we're going to cover um, today in, in the webinar. I suppose the key outcome of the webinar today, the, the takeaway I'd like you to, to have is really how can the process of evaluating a software vendor be more successful for you um, based on just what your typical sort of evaluation process that might come to mind? And I suppose the getting it right for me, the first part of that is, well, what, what happens if it doesn't go right? One of the big problems is, and this happens very, very, very frequently. I mean, you only have to Google success stories or, um, stories online where things have gone badly when people have picked the wrong solution one of the, the one the, the positive side it is you know by picking the right software vendor um, it's you get value for money the project is successful and there's a strong return on investment also for you personally if you're the project manager it's less stress there's admiration career advancement and reputation this might sound you know as being very softish but actually incredibly critical because the, ultimately it's going to drive you and also drive your career in the future i suppose the the key point i would like to to make is that when you're it's and i draw parallels to staff recruitment processes is when you're looking at vendors, the key point is, yes, you look for qualifications and skills, but it's absolutely critical that you get the right fit, okay? And that fit really is two sides. It's one are, do they, could you work with them? And also, is there a budget fit as well? 
There's no point, for example, if they have expectations of you spending, you know, half a million dollars a year, when maybe you, you have that budget in the first year, but you're not going to have it subsequently, uh, because suddenly, you know, you won't be the popular client in year two. And I think a lot of this links with um, almost when you're hiring people, trying to find people where they match your company's values or your university and college's values. And I think that's absolutely critical, is that you need to find a, a, a company that you're going to be able to work with and you're on, your minds are on the right track or on the same track together. Because ultimately, you want, an organ, you want to pick a software product and company to work with where you're on the same page and you're working towards the same goals. The next thing is, and this really does fit in with the whole recruitment process. It's better not to uh, to recruit anybody than to recruit the wrong um, person. So you're better off leaving in, a, in in you're better off leaving a vacancy when you're recruiting than to hire the wrong organisation. Um, and this is really, I have to say, this is a key point that I really like you to take away when you're evaluating systems. Is you need to find the right um, the right uh, product and the right company that you can work with. If you can't find the right product, you're actually better off not starting any project until you find the right product. Because what will end up happening is you'll progress for probably six months, 12 months, 18 months, things will start to fail. But the big problem is, is you're going to have problems getting the budget in the in the future as well, when if you need to go back out to the market. Um, so I think really, a key point is it's about finding a company that fits with you and your organization. I would say some key points to look at is the right size. You know, if you if you are a small organization, a small team, there's no I don't think there's any point you looking at a product from a company where they're absolutely huge. You know, for example, if you're a one person uh, uh, say web or digital team, you know, engaging with a, a large consultancy firm or a huge software company where you're going to need their support, you know, it's not going to be a match. You need to have, there needs to be uh, um, common values between both organizations. Price and budget is a key. You know, you need to make sure you're all on the same page. And, and this is where I really suggest is that you share at least high level thoughts around budget early on with the vendors because they, they will automatically rule themselves out if they're not the right fit and that will save you time as well. There's no point finding out they're not the right fit 12 to 18 months later. And I would say that absolutely the biggest point here is you need to find people who are enthusiastic and knowledgeable about your project. I'll talk about knowledgeable first is particularly say in higher education and universities and colleges, there's a lot of particular needs that are very, very different to even the biggest companies in the world. And from that point of view, you need to find people who know and understand how to solve those pro problems. But I think you need to have, find people who are enthusiastic, that you're not just one of you know, many thousands of, of, of clients. You need people who actually care about the goals and that you're trying to um, to meet. And I think that's absolutely critical. The problem is, is if you don't find the right company to work with, it really has an impact on your team morale. There's an impact on the, your reputation to deliver projects. It also has an impact on user expectations. And this is an issue in many organizations who implement web content management solutions and uh, digital engagement uh, platforms is that these solutions like email they touch off many 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 people across the organization so if it goes badly wrong it's heard and picked up by a lot of people the problem though is if a goal goes wrong you may run into extra costs and look maybe some of that is recoverable but if it goes badly wrong and you have to go back out to market you mightn't get the budget again, or you, it might take a while before you get the budget. So from our own experience, what I would say is that the time, if you pick the wrong solution, 
and this is in any software product and you have to go back out to market you lose about three years competitiveness and that's absolutely critical when things are moving so quickly um, in the digital world so those are things that are really 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 important to keep in mind is that you know if things go wrong it can have a massive impact so therefore it's it's really important that you get the process the evaluation process right so where where are mistakes most often made one of the biggest problems is that people don't allow enough time for the evaluation process and typically this stems out of maybe it taking a long time um, to build up say an RFP or an RFT document and what ends up happening is, is you want to make up some of that time so you issue the RFP and then maybe the deadline for vendors to come back is very very short um, and that, that can cause a problem, a couple of problems. One is that if the timeline for vendors to come back is very, very short, it means that you may not get the quality of vendors that you're looking for. Or so that, and that really depends on how busy, um, if it, whether it's a busy time of the year or not for the the vendors. They may. It's pretty likely that they could rule themselves out, which is not good for yourselves in terms of finding the the right vendor and so it make sure you allow enough time but there's also a lot of tips that I'll be sharing today about how to actually um, speed things up things like purchasing frameworks that you can use that I'll talk about in a moment the next one is that if you write an RFT or an RFP document often you need to get input from across the organization so what the one of the problems is is that you can get feedback from across the organization you then pull all that together and you end up with an absolutely huge document and um, now keep in mind that probably that the response you're going to get from back from every vendor is probably going to be three to five times the size of the document you share so if you share a 100-page document, you're probably going to get a three to 500-page document back. Now, you need to remember that if you're evaluating that from a number of vendors, that's a lot of work. Uh, I would almost say consistently, um, probably bar one exception here, that the, the milestones and the, the, the schedule, the time schedule shared with vendors, I would say it's probably only once a year um, potential customers actually hit those milestones every other time that they run over and that's okay because we see that all the time but just something to keep in mind the next one is not involving vendors early in the process and I suppose what this means is you should really go out there and uh, look at demos and talk to other people who've used different solutions very very early in your process I would say even before you figure out your requirements because there's different approaches to digital engagement there's different processes to uh, web content management and I think if your experience is quite limited in this area just looking at demos I think will be really really helpful the fourth one is a very simple one is, is people not properly checking references or most importantly people checking references far too late and often what I mean by this is that they have checked they have they've done their evaluation they've picked a vendor that they want to work with but then they decide then they they tell the vendor you're the preferred supplier but then they only check the references at that point in time our suggestion would be very much talk to other organizations that have used the systems you're looking to evaluate before you go into a formal process because it can also help you develop an RFP or a request for a proposal or a request for a tender document that is more appropriate and maybe deals with certain concerns um, that some of those customers have raised. The next one is really is not involving the right people within your organization and I suppose especially from a marketing technology point of view the, the obvious people to involve are people from a digital marketing from an IT information security point of view it's absolutely critical because this can have a big impact for example if you want to say host a piece of soft the piece of software uh, within your organization you know, does it fit in with your architecture? Can it link with the systems that you, you have internally? If you want to host it externally, does it match in with your information security standards? That's really, really important because what can end up happening is you could pick a solution and then right just as you're about to get approval, 
something could come up and you have to start from scratch and we see that from time to time and it sets people back with um, quite a number of months. But really the final point is, is especially if you have to go through a sort of a formal purchasing process is often there are what are called framework agreements you can take advantage of that if you have found a solution you'd really like to work with you don't necessarily need to go through a huge formal process so from that point of view um say for example in the us uh, many states have purchasing frameworks where you can maybe get three quotes and go through the process very very quickly in the uk and i think in some other countries now there in the uk there's one in particular called the g cloud which is for purchase purchasing hosted solutions you can actually do that incredibly quickly what it means then is that your valuation process is more focused on the um, evaluating the system than actually a huge purchasing uh, process so where do you go from here Really where you start now is the whole sort of evaluation process and really what I want to do now is share a lot of sort of simple and straightforward pieces of advice and share experiences with you that I think will actually help you through the process or at least make sure that you don't trip up along the way. And I suppose ultimately it's about picking the right, the right partner for you to be able to work with. So the first thing I would do is I would say is plan out the process plan out how you're actually going to evaluate the systems and do this in advance so you're setting expectations early with those across the organization and um, that you need input from but also internally you're able to show that you're actually thinking about this in a really clever way depending on your organization and um, you may need to consult with procurement or purchasing and um, that can be key. Consult with the legal, that might be important, particularly for bigger projects. Obviously, budget holders, nothing worse than going through a whole evaluation process and then discovering that the budget uh, can't be released or some other issue around that. The key point is don't rush. You know, allow enough time. You can do things that will speed things up, but certainly for, like even say an RFP process, where there's a budget of less than say fifty thousand dollars, you know, you need to allow six to eight weeks. Um, for bigger projects, it can be eight to twelve weeks. We sometimes see evaluations going on, you know, for three to four months. But I would say it's a, probably it doesn't need to be as as long as say four to six months. But you need to at least an, allow enough time. What I would say is is that often from when you know you want to go ahead to actually picking a vendor that you're going to work with. It can be anywhere between four and 12 months. So allow that into your time frame. Just on a small uh, small point to raise is that given that there, there's a lot of time involved in picking the right strategic solutions for your organization, what I'd say is, is don't then rush the implementation. You know, what you don't want to do is we'll say, well, look, it took 12 months to, uh, to select the right product, but now we want to implement it really quickly because that obviously you can trip up um, during that part of the project as well. But again, we won't we won't talk about that today. So in relation to the next slide, the, here's, here's a high level process. Now, please don't worry about the details and don't worry about the, the different sort of stages. But you can see here, there's a lot of different steps that are required. Now, I think you can short circuit some of these and I think you can be more agile. Um, I think definitely there's a trend in the marketplace to being more sort of hands-on, being more, if you're allowed, to be more demo-focused and um, scenario-focused in your evaluation of solutions rather than having to sort of go through a lot of paperwork, okay? But today we're going to, I'm going to show you as well talking about our sort of our effective, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the next thing I'm going to be talking about is writing the RFP or RFT document. And... But hopefully that will help short circuit some of the paperwork side of things. Really in this process here, firstly, you need to look at what are your needs? What is the business case? What are the KPIs you want to meet? What I would say is write a very short RFI document, get feedback and demos from, um, from different vendors and really identify a list of potential vendors. What I would then recommend is looking at do quick demonstrations to get a good feel of who might be the right fit. What work have they done in your area before? Now, then the, really the part in the middle here is the sort of the RFP or the RFT process. This 
will really depend on your organization. You might want to do this quite quickly. It might just be more of a quotation process. It could be more extensive. But I would say that current trend is to spend more time looking at the products and working with them, even doing workshops with them, rather than actually going through like a 500 page RFP or RFT document. The next piece then is the evaluation. I think this is key. You know, it's looking through reviewing the documents, find who you could best work with. I think a key point here is organize the end user demonstrations and organize technical demonstrations. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I think it is important that you separate those both out. Then what I would do is, is, is narrow it down to some favorites and really then spend more time with them. So as I said, really the key thing is, is to probably spend more time looking at scenarios, looking at the products and working with them as opposed to evaluating a very, very large document. Depending on the size of your project, you might want to sort of agree a pilot project, but some people just go straight into like their, their, their first project might be a small enough project, but it's to construct the, the contracts in such a way that you could walk away if you find that as you're starting to uh, work on it with uh, a particular solution that it doesn't match your particular needs. So this is process is just quite indicative and feel free to, you know, obviously cut out the parts that aren't necessary. But as I said, the key trend is to do that, to, is to, for the evaluation processes of systems and companies to be more hands-on rather than based on responses to very large documents. So one of the things I would like to sort of go through today is, well, actually, how do you, write a good and effective RFP or RFT document. And I think this is this is something that, you, as I said, you might want to keep this part of the process quite short or you might want, you actually your organization, organization may demand that this is a, you know, a formal sort of RFP or RFT document, as I said, if you're, uh, particularly if you're publicly funded. But one of the things that, um, I'm going to talk about today is we actually have a sample or a document which you can use as a base and this could save you months of time um, and I'll share that with you. So really I suppose a few key points I'd like to talk about first. If you have to go down, uh, go down this road there are a couple of problems and things to avoid. Firstly if you write and issue a very 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 large RFP or RFT document you are going to get a very very large response. I mean that's just that's going to be that's just going to be the case. So what you need to think about is is well okay what are the real questions? I think you can presume that certain features are just standard um you know, particularly if they're a leader in the marketplace. So mainly focus maybe on the things that are really important to you. Also, keep in mind the number of vendors you ask to participate because if you ask, say, 60 vendors to come in, now, in, in, depending on the product area, there may not be 60 uh, vendors, but it's something that to keep in mind. Some organizations need to advertise publicly. So maybe what you could do is issue a small document, an RFI document first, where everybody could respond to and then you could pick the vendors that you want uh, to actually engage with in a more detailed way. But if you get a lot of responses, you're going to have a lot of products um, to evaluate as well. The next step really is avoid repetition. We see this very, very frequently, particularly when people go out within the organization and need to get feedback on, you know, well, what are there things that you'd like to include? Um, that sort of question is posed across the organization. What I would say then is, is that you need to spend the time to remove uh, repetition. We see this very, very frequently where repetition, uh, you see documents that are repeating themselves. Now the problem is, is that, okay, we could answer those questions a number of times, but that's going to make your document even bigger. But maybe the other, if you don't want to remove repetition because you want to respect the feedback that people have given you across the organization, I'd make sure that you have very clear instructions to the vendors to say how to deal with repetition. Because some vendors will say, they'll put, they'll put in one answer once, and then they'll point to that answer from a number of locations. Now, that can work, but where it doesn't work is that you then send that on to, uh, you say, when you get the responses back, you split up the responses and you send them out to different parts of the organization to evaluate maybe a 
a certain part of the document. Now the problem is, is if they don't receive the whole document, it's hard for them to evaluate it. Also, it's very annoying if they have to jump from part of the from one part of the document to the other. The next thing is that because there's a time and effort required to, to read and properly evaluate um, a response. If it's difficult to evaluate, it's going to be difficult. If sorry, if it's difficult, yeah, if it's difficult to evaluate, it's just going to be a really painful activity, and you're going to lose interest, and people are going to not really evaluate them. So I think it's all about simple questions where you get simple answers and making it very clear that someone can indicate when they're answering a question, whether it's included, whether it's not included, whether it's an extra cost or whether there is no extra cost. And those are absolutely crit critical. The final thing I would say is avoid crazy purchasing and procurement questions. This is really, this happens a lot in, and actually does happen a lot, where organizations, they get a standard set of terms and conditions, perhaps, or a standard set of questions from their purchasing or their legal people. They include them without actually reading them in the main document. So one of the things we see very frequently is we see terms and conditions or questions being placed within the, 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 the RFP document that say in the case of a university or college, you may have cases where you're getting, say, radioactive materials or so on delivered to the university for, say, science labs, or you might be getting very big equipment delivered. And they'll have huge, you can actually find, like they'll have maybe a dozen questions on how you're going to physically deliver the product. But if it's software, that's not the case. So I think it's okay to go back and go and say, well, look, you know, these questions really aren't applicable. For, for what we're purchasing. And, you know, I think, to be honest, that, that would be, I think it would be sensible enough to take out those questions. But we have seen, like, where they've asked about how we deal with delivering radioactive materials. So I, I'm very proud to say Terminal 4 um, software does not include any radioactive materials. I'm very proud of that. So one of the things that we've uh, put together to help everybody with their uh, purchasing process uh, is to try and help you with the with the RFP or RFT uh, process. Because it takes such a long time to, uh, to write one of these documents, and particularly if you have to follow this process, what we've actually done is we've put together a sample template that you can use. Now, it is written um, from a higher education point of view, but it could be applied to any particular market, actually, and it could be adapted um, for any industry, and I suppose with a bit of extra work, you could, you'd need to use the general structure. You could use the general structure of it for other types of products. And um, so it's available. You can download it actually from our website from the URL that's shown on screen. And it's it's something you can use. It's in Word document format, and that's something that I'm going to uh, talk about in a few moments to to give you an idea of. Um, what's with uh, what's in it and also how to use it. So one of the things, even if you don't use our sample or FP, there's some key points that I would definitely take on board. Firstly, make sure you give a good background uh, on your project. You know, why are you implementing or looking for a particular system? Are there problems that you've had in the past? Um, are there goals or the KPIs you're looking to, to meet? The, the next part is describe the purchasing process, set expectations early on as to what, um, uh, you know, what process you're going to follow and the timelines. But as I said, you know, often the timelines uh, are never followed. So keep that in mind. You know, you list your functional requirements, you list your sort of supporting uh, professional services requirements, you know, what support you need, training and so on. But also from a pricing point of view, be very clear as to, to what you want the pricing on. You know, do you, in the case of web content management, is it to include migration? If so, what system are you coming from? And so on. So that's something I want to talk about now in relation to our sample RFP. 
the sample ORFP that I mentioned is available to download from that URL and you'll see here it's fairly well structured. We've got a good table of contents at the beginning which talks about the various parts of it initially focusing on the goals, supporting information and particular feature requirements within the solution. You'll notice that all the areas in yellow are ones you really should focus on and customizing for your particular needs but as it's in word format that's fairly straightforward. The first area we focus on is asking particular questions around the um, uh, company, the proposed project team and approach, um, support services, training, etc. We then hone in on areas like references um, and also then we've asked some really good general questions about how an org uh, how the potential vendor could meet your particular needs and again you can customize these from industry to industry then within the main part of the document we talk about features you'll see here that each individual feature is listed here again you can customize these you should set whether they're a mandatory requirement uh, highly desired or optional and then over here uh, we'll talk about the checkboxes that a vendor needs to to select. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Throughout this there are some things highlighted in yellow. For example, accessibility standards may depend on what country you're coming from and so on. As you can see the document is quite extensive and we've covered um, covered a lot of functional areas. I would definitely recommend that you encourage vendors to include screenshots because you know screenshots a picture tells a thousand words and with a screenshot you can often get a good idea of, of what's possible rather than having to read a large volume of text. So I hope this sample RFP is helpful but again if you have any questions feel free to comment below on our YouTube account or feel free to contact us by Twitter or other social media um, channels. I mentioned there about how to ask the right question and um, to get a s straightforward answer. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to focus on how not to pose a question. Uh, and I suppose the reason for this is that if you ask a question that's not clear or is very complicated, it's not easy for you to evaluate. And so what it means is that if, for example, if you ask a vague question, you're going to get a vague answer. So what we recommend is a very, very sort of focused question. And in the Word document there, you'll have seen that there was it was built in a very particular way. So here, for example, is a question, and it just says yes, yes, with customization, no. And what well, you find is pretty like a lot of vendors will just go yes, yes, yes. But the problem is, it could be yes, it's a core feature. It could be yes with customization, but it could be actually yes with customization, but no cost. There could be a cost. So how do you actually compare? And this can be quite tricky, particularly when you're trying to um, evaluate apples and oranges. What we recommend is, is that pose very clear questions, short questions, and very specific, um, looking for very specific information. What we suggest is that there's different versions of yes. Yes, it's out of the box. Yes, with customization. No or not available. But you have a little check box available if it's an additional cost, which could apply to any of the three options above, obviously except for no, not available. But it could be yes out of the box, but it might have no additional cost, or it might have yes with custom customization, but there is additional cost. It's something to keep in mind. And for example, one of the I want to show you some bad examples and these are actual questions that we've taken from RFPs um, over the last number of years. And here's the uh, first example. It says use of unique IDs for users to allow for changes to fundamental parts of their profile, such as surname, while ensuring seamless um, continuance of their rights, roles, profiles. I think we think we understand what that means, but like it just is explained in a very, very crazy way and I think what you could end up finding is vendors could misinterpret that it's not really clear like I think are they saying is that if somebody's name changes that their profile information stays intact throughout the system and um, again it's a good example the next one is one that is very 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 vague so we're actively expanding our customer base the WCMS must allow increased customer numbers to be supported while maintaining good performance. It's just not clear as to what information you're looking from the vendor. A vendor will go, yeah, okay, that's fine, we can help with that. But is there a particular thing you're looking for? I think that's absolutely um, 
really important. With those two bad examples, I hope you'll be able to see what, I, what I'm getting at. So some good examples is like very, very short, focused questions. You know, looking for exactly what you're looking for. So it's saying like, you know, the, the web content management system should not produce content that is reliant on client-side scripting languages. You know, we want to be able to produce sitemaps. Now, these are quite straightforward features. So I think what you need to do is keep in mind that a lot of systems, there's, there's probably no point saying, well, your web content management system needs to allow you to edit content because, you know, they wouldn't be a web content management system if they didn't allow you to do that. So I think that's something to keep in mind. It's like at what level, what type of questions do you want to ask? The, so the next piece really I want to talk about is, well, how do you actually evaluate the the vendors in a very, very efficient way? So you've sent out the RFP documents, you get the, you get the responses back, but actually how do you uh, evaluate the vendors? So while you might get responses back from the vendors that are very comprehensive. I think it's really important that you actually meet their team and you should set that expectation with the vendors when perhaps they're coming to demonstrate is that you actually want to meet them face to face. I would recommend this definitely over and above doing remote demonstrations. Remote demonstrations are very useful early on but when you start getting into your short list of vendors, it's really important to meet them face to face because you just mightn't get on. Also with web demonstrations, it can be difficult, particularly if there's a large a large number of people in your room looking at the web demonstration. It can be often difficult for the vendors to hear the questions and so on, engage the room um, and tweak their presentation accordingly. Also, I suppose, you're going to have to work with some of these people. So ask to meet, like, well, who will be my project manager? Who are the people you're going to work with? Because you need to make sure that you can actually get on well with them because that's really, I suppose, key to the project. The second part is how enthusiastic are they around your project? You know, like if they're, you know, if they're late, if they're, you know, if they haven't put any effort into the demonstration, if they don't understand your business or not asking right questions, you know, really, that's probably a good point, you know, it's a bit like dating, you know, just quit early. You know, if it's not going to work out, there's no point wasting everybody's time. So what I also, the third thing I would say is when you're looking at references, as well as uh, evaluating them very early on, is through your own networks, find other people who are using the system and have a chat with them. And I would do that prior to sort of your your evaluation process, uh, especially the face-to-face -face part, because you might it might help you pick questions that you can ask. I would say is either your first project on a particular system should be a pilot or it should be a small project so you can get your head around it, but also you can see, you know, is are they the right people to work with? It's all about the fit. It's all about finding a vendor that you can really work with and that you, you're all focused towards the same goals. And I would say that is absolutely the most important uh, evaluation criteria, as well as it having the base functionality um, that you need. For example, you might though find that a solution doesn't have necessarily all of the features, but they could be just much nicer people to deal with than a solution that maybe has all the features, but the, the, the proposed project manager just has a real attitude problem or is to them you're just a very very small customer not really that important and you'll gauge that and I think that's really really important that you find an organization right fit as I said earlier on in the webinar it's about finding a, um, a vendor that is the that works with you and towards the same goals but it's important that you don't hire a vendor that doesn't fit in. You're better off not hiring somebody than to hire um, from a, a group of uh, vendors that you're not comfortable with. As a conclusion, I'd like to really cover two areas. One is getting inside the mind of a vendor. This, I suppose, is any software vendor. Um, really to understand where they're coming from. And I think hopefully you'll be able to learn a lot that will help your evaluation processes be more successful. The The second part is really the, the takeaways, the, the 10 golden rules that I'd like to share with you. Firstly, talking about the 
getting inside the mind of a vendor. So really, as I said earlier on in the webinar, it's all about finding the right partner, right? And I think one of the problems is out in the marketplace is that you can advertise maybe an RFP, have lots of vendors come back. But what you want to make sure is that the pool of people pitching for your business are of good enough quality. And I think that's one of the problems is that, and this is sometimes where purchasing departments and procurement departments, they're more interested in getting a wide range of vendors to participate rather than high quality vendors. So one of the things that I'd say is that vendors are actually adverse to risk. Um, they don't want to get involved in projects that are um, that are going to fail, uh, that maybe aren't resourced up, or maybe just they've got the, the wrong the wrong reasons for implementing a particular system, um, the wrong motivation behind the project. So vendors do a lot of evaluation as to what business they pitch for. I'd certainly say the very professional ones do, okay? So what I would say is vendors are adverse to risk, but something that you need to consider are they are not they become less adverse to risk if they're not very busy. So if they don't have many projects coming up, particularly in, in poor economic times. A salesperson is under a lot of pressure to reach targets. Um, what they might do is they might say, oh, well, we'll go for that because I don't have any other proposals to put in. And they might actually mightn't be really the right fit. Um, and I think also if the software company is bigger than your organization, I think you need to be careful about that because, again, they might have big targets and they'll pitch for lots of things and they'll hope that their brand will carry them. Usually, though, if it's a big organization and they have a very professional sales structure, they will what's called no bid for particular projects. And don't be offended. But I think when somebody no bids, if they were a company you really wanted to consider, I think you should really look into why they're no bidding. Because it could be things like, for example, like you've set the timelines to respond um, to be very, very short. What I would also consider is the whole thing of variation in price. And this impacts budget. So what I'm going to show you is a little graph here um, that looks around, looks at the timing of when you should issue your RFP or RFT. What you will see is, is that there is variations in price. Firstly, vendors will increase price, particularly around professional service, if the project is perceived to be very risky, if they find that you may be tricky to deal with. Um, and also how well they know your industry. And that's something to keep in mind. But in terms of timing, it's something to consider. Now, this uh, this particular chart here, we've we've just looked at, um, uh, we've looked at a year, it was actually a number of years ago where we collected this data, but actually it's, it's quite common. But what I would say, this chart here shows the number of RFPs issued in a particular time period, in a particular year. Uh, it was actually a number of years ago, but what we're seeing, the same pattern applies. Now, when I say the same pattern applies, I think what you'll find is, is that it will vary from country to country, and I'll talk about this. So this particular uh, data here is, um, is for England. It's the number of RFPs issued, I think, in England, Scotland, and Wales within a year, uh, within the digital engagement and uh, web content management space, particularly in higher education. And what you're finding is really there are three peaks in the year. There's February, there's, I think, the July time frame, and then there is the, um, I think, later on in December time frame. Now, what it, these vary. I think what we found a little bit more recently is that there tends to be a higher peak in the middle of the year. So what does this mean? Well, firstly, some organizations have their budgets based around a January calendar year. So they maybe the budget isn't released. So what they need is they need the issue. They do a lot of work before um, the holidays and then they need responses back in January or February. In a lot of universities, particularly, for example, in this case, and um, in the UK, but also it happens in the US, is that a lot of RFPs are issued around June, July, which is the, their financial year. Uh, in the US, you'll find a lot in sort of May and June and so on. Um, and also because a lot of people are looking to try and launch projects in, say, August, September, 
you know they issue the the documents and the RFPs at a particular time frame. Uh, what you'll find is often organizations, they might find that they ha in good economic times, they might have budget left over and they try and get it into a financial year. If they're going by calendar year, they try and use their budget before the end of the year. So what I would say is don't, don't worry about too much about the actual data here that you're seeing on screen. Um, it varies from country to country. In Australia, it's a very different time, uh, time frames. Um, there's certain parts of the year that are very busy. So what I would say is for you to p get the right selection of vendors putting in proposals into your organization you need to try and avoid issuing it at a time of the year where every other university or organization is also trying to issue an RFP if you go for the slightly quieter time in the year you'll get better quality responses and also if you're trying to implement the project in a time frame where it's not overlapping with everybody else, you also should be able to get better value for money. For example, we have a lot of clients in the higher ed space who are trying to implement and go live around August, September. That's just a really busy period for us. But where we have a lot of clients where uh, January, February, March timeframe we actually have a little bit more scope to implement projects. So it's something to keep in mind that you might get better value for money um, in terms of your proposals. So with that in mind, I want to just talk about the 10 golden rules. So the 10 golden rules that I'd like to talk through today, the first one is really don't rush the process. I mentioned that earlier on, and I think it's something that is worth stressing again, is you know, take your time, find the right vendors, but I think be efficient where you can be efficient, uh, but certainly don't rush the implementation after conducting a very thorough uh, evaluation. It's something that it really can have a negative impact on your project. The second was time the release of your RFP. If you need to go down this path, really make try and do a little bit of research as to when's the best time. Hopefully our sample RFP is really helpful for you. And uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to engage with us uh, through social media. The third one is don't have too many people attend the initial presentations. And I think that's really quite important, is particularly when you're trying to do a bit of information gathering earlier on, have a small group of people who will have really a key role in the project attend. It's particularly if you're doing them by webinar, it can be very difficult if there's a large number of people attending. Linked with that is particularly if you have an on-site demonstration, is don't mix the end user and the technical parts of the presentation. Keep them separate. What happens is if the techies will probably have very detailed questions and if there are end users in the audience, they will be turned off potentially by some of those very technical questions and they may not actually want to ask the questions that are important to them. That's something that's very important. And I would also really make sure as part of that is um, for the end users have a wide variety of people across the organization attend. The fifth golden rule I'd like to leave you with is seek the vendor advice as early as possible in the process. I think you'll learn from them. They're experts. They do this all the time. They know what features are popular and not popular, what work best. You know, engage with them early. Don't be frightened of them. You know, they want you to have a successful project too. The sixth golden rule I'd like to leave you with is really allow for sufficient time for the presentation. And that's when you're doing an online or a face-to-face -face demonstration. It happens from time to time where people want to do far, far too much in a presentation in a very short amount of time. Uh, we've had situations where we were given 200 features that we should show. And I think that's probably a bad idea anyway. In a demonstration, it's better to go with more of a scenario approach in 30 minutes. Like, how is that going to work out? 15 seconds a feature? You know, you're better off honing in on sort of seeing certain scenarios and stuff like that as part of the process, um, as part of the demonstration process. Um, we, we would say probably two to three hours is a good time for maybe two hours for the initial in-depth presentation. And then maybe you know, 45 minutes to an hour for end users. The seventh one is everything that I talked about around the RFP and RFTs. Ask specific questions and get specific answers and avoid repetition. That's definitely something you should take on board, but hopefully our sample RFP is helpful. The eighth point 
uh, is use existing purchasing frameworks. And often the vendors should have a good idea of what frameworks you might be able to use. So even if your own purchasing team don't, although they should, probably should, um, it's something that vendors might be able to share that information with you. Um, and particularly what we found is, particularly with recent uh, frameworks, for example, like in England, the G Cloud arrangement, purchasing departments mightn't actually be fully aware of what's available for them to use. So definitely have that conversation with the vendors because if it speeds up your valuation, that's good for you overall. The ninth, er the ninth point I'd like to leave you with is be careful using open demo areas. And definitely these are more uh, popular in recent times with the more hands-on evaluation valuation process. What I would definitely say is when you're evaluating systems or taking a look, uh, whether demos or workshops um, or sort of open demo areas, is I would a couple of little tips I would leave you with is avoid doing open demo setups with a number of vendors at the same time because particularly there can be with sophisticated products there can be a learning curve and it can be sometimes tricky to get your head around which feature you saw in what product. What happened to us a number of years ago is actually we had one potential client ask us questions about another product because they actually were getting confused about which products they were looking at. Um, so I would just say is if you're going to do sort of a hands-on session, maybe do a workshop or ask a vendor to conduct a training session because then you can actually evaluate the quality of their training, but also you can evaluate, evaluate the system. One of the problems, particularly in relating to web content management and digital engagement, is the terminology can, can be different from system to system. And I think that that's something that you need to keep in mind um, because it can lead to some confusion. Not the fault of any vendor, but just it can help you evaluate uh, these systems if you at least have a bit of a more detailed, in-depth understanding. And the last point I'd really like to leave with you is, is make sure that the right fit. And this is, I've stressed this throughout today's webinar, and it's really make sure that they are the right fit from a project point of view, from the point of view of the people you're going to work with, and then finally that the product is the right fit. And I think that's absolutely key. And I think the, the, the point I made very early on about it's like going through a hiring process I think as I said the two points there is that it's it's really important that you don't hire anybody then hire somebody who's the the wrong fit and also trying to find someone who's got similar values to yourself Thank you very much for attending today's webinar I hope you found it very helpful if you have any further questions please do engage with us through our social media channels and um, and subscribe to our YouTube uh, video channel we also have a very, very good blog, which I think is worth subscribing to at terminal4.com forward slash blog, where we talk about digital engagement and digital marketing in higher education. Um, very, very popular. And also, if you have any suggestions for future webinars or future blog posts, please do contact us. And again, thank you very, very much for your time. My name is Piero Tintori. I'm CEO here at Terminal 4. And we'd love to work with you at some point in the future. Thank you.